watching FJTN, the Federal Judicial Television Network. The Federal Judicial Center presents Science in the Courtroom, a series of programs for judges on science and scientific evidence. Program 5, Basic Principles of Epidemiology. This lecture is presented by Dr. Leon Gordis, Professor of Epidemiology at the Johns Hopkins University School of Hygiene and Public Health. Dr. Gordis is also a Professor of Pediatrics at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. In recent years, epidemiology has taken on increasing importance in the courts, largely as a result of the Daubert ruling that places increasing responsibility on judges to understand the scientific underpinnings of the evidence which they hear. The purpose of my presentation is to try to give you an overview of epidemiology as a science. It is done in much greater detail in the second edition of the reference manual on scientific evidence published by the Federal Judicial Center and in particular in the reference guide to epidemiology. In this presentation, after a few introductory comments, I will try to describe to you the kinds of study designs that are used in epidemiology, how the findings from epidemiologic studies are used to infer causality, what are some of the problems with such inferences, and then to close with some specific comments that are of interest to judges and to the courts. If we want to know about disease in human populations, we have to be able to study human populations. We can do excellent studies in rodents, for example, but even the best such study means that we have to extrapolate from one species to another. And therefore, studies of human beings are critical. Epidemiology plays this role. What is epidemiology? This uh, slide shows you one such definition. It is the study of how disease distributes in human populations and what determines differences in disease risk among different population subgroups. Why does one group of people have a higher risk of disease than another? What can we learn from that? How can that help us to prevent disease? And if we turn to how epidemiology is used, there are many uses of which three are shown here. First, epidemiology helps us to assess the magnitude of the community burden of disease. How much disease and what type of disease is there in our community? Second, epidemiology helps us to identify the cause of human disease, a critical factor if we're going to be able to prevent disease. And finally, epidemiology is used to study the effectiveness of different types of treatments. In this presentation, I'm going to focus on the second use, to identify the causes of human disease, because this is the use that is most prominent in toxic tort cases. Underlying all this is the basic assumption that disease is not randomly distributed in human populations. That is, some people have higher risks of disease than others. And what we want to do is to account for why the risk is higher in some people than another in order to identify factors that can be modified in order to prevent disease. You see here a list of some tongue-in-cheek facts about carrots. Nearly all sick people have eaten carrots. Obviously, the effects are cumulative. An estimated 99.9% .9 of people who die from cancer and heart disease have eaten carrots. 99.9% .9 of people involved in car crashes ate carrots within 60 days of their accidents. 93.1% of juvenile delinquents come from homes where carrots are served regularly. And finally, among people born in 1839 who later ate carrots, there has been a 100% mortality rate. Now, we might chuckle in looking at this list, but it pays to ask, what is the real problem here? And the problem is that we have no comparison group. These data are given without knowing what is the percent of people in the general population who have eaten carrots. And so underlying the questions that epidemiology addresses is the need for comparisons. And I will stress this during this presentation. How does epidemiology and epidemiologists go about their work? 
We basically have a two-step process as seen here. First, we try to determine whether there is an association between an exposure and a disease or adverse health outcome. If we demonstrate that there is an exposure, we then try to determine whether the observed association reflects a causal relationship of the exposure and the health outcome. I will first focus on the first question to determine whether or not there is an association between an exposure and a disease or adverse health outcome. This is a quotation from the Roman or Greek physician Galen, who was well recognized in his day as being an expert physician. He wrote as follows about the treatments he provided. All who drink of this treatment recover in a short time, except those whom it does not help who all die. It's obvious, therefore, that it fails only in incurable cases. His excellent reputation may have very well been built on the logic implicit in this, because we have here a hypothesis that could not be falsified. There was no way of disproving this. The essence of what we do in science and in epidemiology is to develop hypotheses that we can test and either confirm them or refute them. And this is an essential. I'd like to turn to the types of study designs, therefore, that we would use in trying to confirm or refute a hypothesis. The first type of study is the randomized trial, also called the randomized clinical trial, because it's often used in testing new therapies. What is the design shown here? We begin with a study population and we randomly assign the members of that population in this slide to a current treatment or to a new treatment. We then follow up both groups of patients, determine how many die from the disease in the current treatment and how many dies from the, die from the disease in the new treatment. If the new treatment is more effective than the current treatment, we would expect to see fewer people dying from the disease who receive the new treatment than receive the current treatment. So the design of the randomized trial is basically a simple one, and it's a very desirable type of study. Let's turn to the issue of breast implants and connective tissue disease, which has received great attention. If we wanted to carry out a randomized trial of breast implants, we would identify a population of women who would be randomly assigned to receive breast implants or not receive implants, and then the both groups would be followed to determine what percent of each group develops connective tissue disease. Clearly, this diagram represents a hypothetical because we could never carry out such a study. We would never get women to cooperate, we could not do it for ethical reasons, and so it is really a totally theoretical design because a randomized trial can be carried out only when we are looking at a potentially beneficial intervention. If we have a toxic or potentially toxic substance or a putative carcinogen, clearly we cannot randomize human populations to receive that type of agent. Nevertheless, the randomized trial is often considered the gold standard, the, the standard of truth that we try to emulate even in other types of study design. If we're not able to randomly assign people, we have the following type of study called a cohort study. A defined population, not randomly assigned, but self-selects or is assigned by other people to exposure or non-exposure. People, for example, may work in a certain industrial plant. Others seek jobs in another plant. And then we follow up people who have the exposure and people who don't have the exposure and look at the rate of disease in both groups. If indeed the exposure is related to disease, we would expect to see a greater number of people with disease in the exposed group than in the non-exposed group. 